where do you even start? Now let me tell you the story and how I became a farmer overnight. See, I'm not a farmer. Or I wasn't a farmer. Kind of starting to look like I'm a farmer. This place is kind of starting to look like a farm. Uh, boy, where do you begin? So I lived on five acres and I was pretty happy with my little life here. And there's all this land that was up beside me, or behind me rather. And uh, it came up for sale. We decided we didn't want to stick around for whoever bought this land behind us. And we were going to sell our home, move somewhere else, do something different. And then the economy went to ground. We couldn't sell our house. So, as every logical person does, instead of selling our house, we went further into debt. And we bought all this land behind me. Now I'll put some pictures up because I just kind of had this idea of people who may be in my same situation who are not farmers, but find themselves with a $100,000 mortgage on land and no way to really make it pay for itself. Now when we bought this land, it did not look like this. This is not what I bought uh, about seven months ago now. I closed on this property at the end of December. We're now sitting uh, July 5th, I believe is today. And uh, it's been quite the transformation from mesquite covered pasture and sagebrush and weed to uh, this pretty good looking crop. And I can't complain. Now this transformation was not without heavy investment. Uh, as with anything you do in life, you gotta put a little bit of skin in the game, right? And so it took a lot of diesel and skid steer work and. If you look over there in that back corner, you might be able to see one giant brush pile, another giant brush pile. There's a lot of trees and a lot of diesel and a lot of time, but I cleared this place up and then I did what every other logical person does and started buying up farm equipment like mad uh, to try to make a profitable season off the first year of this ownership of land. So uh, let's get into what I did and I'll show you some of the equipment I bought and it's pretty grown up because we've had some rain. Uh, which is something you're really going to love and hate all at the same time now that you're an overnight farmer. Now, if you look behind me, you see a myriad of pieces of equipment and stuff I just bought. Um, and with interest in full honesty, a lot of this stuff I have co-invested with my dad, who also has some acreage that we're now farming since I became an overnight farmer. Now, probably the first and most important piece of equipment you're going to need is going to be something like this. This is now a very nice tractor. We bought it, not a very nice tractor. Uh, we paid $15,000 for this 1969 John Deere 4020 with a loader. Now this old tractor took multiple man hours to rebuild a myriad of it. And we didn't even scratch the surface of everything needs to be done. We did a whole lot of wiring, paint and body, diesel injectors, pump, all kinds of things. Luckily for us, somebody had already split it open and put in a new clutch and saved us the time. New tires, new wheels, makeshift weights, all the fun things. Don't forget that giant awning we put on, which is a rope system, which is great in case you get stuck on something and try to flip your tractor over. Maybe you won't get crushed. Another concern when you become an overnight farmer is learning machine safety. Now, in the further interest of full disclosure, uh, I'm not a novice at running equipment. I grew up on tractors and skid steers, backhoes, uh, occasionally road graders, and I've done plenty of dirt work, uh, grading the slope and digging septic tanks, building drives. Um, I'm familiar with big equipment. And if you're not familiar with big equipment, this is going to be a very important part of your learning as an overnight farmer. There is a lot of safety involved in any of this equipment. It is all very dummy, not proof. You gotta be careful. You will maim or kill yourself if you're not doing the right stuff and paying attention all the time. So head on a swivel if you buy your first tractor. And furthermore, into the whole part of full disclosure is I did become an overnight farmer, but I didn't come in with zero experience. I've worked for ranchers and farmers throughout high school and in college. I worked on my stepdad's hay farm with his dad. And uh, 
So I do know a little bit about what I'm doing, but I really don't. You see, when you're 18, 19, 20 years old, you may get to run the hay cutter through the field. You may get to plow off the field, but you don't know why you're doing it, where you're doing it. You don't pay attention to the time of the year or the importance of the ground moisture or any of the stuff that is actually pretty critical for growing hay. Now, if you find yourself becoming an overnight farmer, this is not to say that the only thing you can do is hay. There's plenty of other crops, plenty of other things you can get into. But for the money, my knowledge, expertise, and the kind of land I'm running, the only thing that made sense on 20 acres was probably to do hay. Uh, it's familiar, it's semi low risk, it has the lowest equipment investment, and uh, it looks pretty. So you got a tractor and you got some land and you don't know how you're gonna pay for this land or at least make it pay for itself so you're not just spending money on land to look at. And sure, you could shoot a couple deer off it a year and write it off as, well, that's good enough. But it's not really good enough because I don't wanna pay $600 a month to stare at some grass. I'd like to cut the grass and sell it to people and then pay for the land and make a little bit of money on the side, hopefully. So the next thing you're gonna need, and this is a controversial topic, you're gonna need a plow. Now, a lot of people just lost me. They heard me say the forbidden P word, and the new modern age, regenerative farming, agriculture, green, polyculture, general regenerative agriculture, farming, plow. Plows are not good. Plows are terrible. Plows kill all your nitrogen. They take the phosphorus and the potash out of the ground and they turn over the soil and you lose your microbar. I get it. I get it, okay? I've seen Joel Salatin. I watch the No-Till Grower channel. I do all the cool stuff. I got all the soil books. I get it. Plowing's not cool. It's not great. It's not good. Here's what the people in the regenerative world don't tell you. You can't do the white oaks pasture method year one, year two, probably even year three. And here's the problem. You're coming in to a piece of land, more than likely, like I did. It was inundated with mesquite, covered in weeds, covered in thistle, silver leaf nightshade, all the good stuff that's not good, potato weed, all these noxious, oh, don't forget the gourds, the whole giant thing of gourds. All these noxious plants that are not good for forage quality, they're not particularly good for anything other than maybe keeping the soil from being compacted. And as much as I would love to come out here and just no-till, uh, that's expensive hard to get going with your feet underneath you starting from scratch like we did I didn't have any of this stuff and so yeah here it is the big evil P word this is a John Deere unknown model it's pretty old bought it from a buddy of mine that uh, he rebuilt the bearings and put newer discs newer tires new hoses new cylinder very well built plow. It's a little light for what he was wanting to do and his soil type and clay. And so we bought it. And this was important because after I rented a skid steer with a grubber and spent a week of my life and $600 in diesel removing hundreds, and I do mean hundreds, of small mesquite trees. Oh, about the size of these. That were about a foot apart throughout the entirety of the acreage. I had a torn up mess. And anybody who's ever done any grubbing knows you got a torn up mess. Because the only way to get these trees and effectively get rid of them is to pull them out by the root. And with a grubbing spear, it's like a bee. You hit it, you pull it out, and you're left with a hole of dirt. You try to move it around and backfill the hole, but it's not particularly effective. So the next thing we got, because the little disc just wasn't quite enough, is a harrow. This is an Athens 97. I believe it's eight and a half foot and it's got a real big beefy disc on it look at that tarot disc what this does is breaks up uh, compaction and clumps and chunks and helps kind of screed everything around and help even up that field so it's not so rough and so that you don't have giant holes throughout your field which will come in later uh, at being pretty important when you're running more sensitive equipment like a swather a rake and over there you can see it in the shed is a baler a rough field is rough on equipment 
and the only way I know of of getting a field to not be rough is cross-directional plowing and disking. It is what it is. Uh, is it not the best thing for the soil? No. But you can't you can't do 30-year regenerative farming year one. Can't do it. And that's the little dirty little secret of the regenerative world that I don't think guys are very honest about is uh you have to start somewhere and all of them almost guaranteed started with a plow to break that fruit ground in to get it to a point where it's aggregable enough to work with a no-till program which is what i'm trying to do my first goal is to get a perennial grass system but for this year i planted a sudas which is a sorghum sudan hay grazer is what it's familiarly called around here in west texas and what this is going to do is it's going to help Put a large canopy over the most of the field, outcompete the weed system, so I'm not having to spray uh, well as much. And we'll get into that. It'll help break up soil compaction. It'll help exudate out good nutrients into the soil. And hopefully next year I'll be able to establish a perennial grass hay system with probably annual winter crops such as legumes and cool season grasses like oats and beardless wheat. Uh, now let's get into spraying. Well, like everything else you hear from the very much I do support regenerative agricultural world, chemicals are bad, and they are. 2,4-D, not good. Duracore, all these things, not good. Uh, DDT, back in the day, terrible, not great. But there is a time and a place to use them. They're a tool like anything else, and sometimes you can't get away, especially in the first year. Uh, we'll go into this field over here on the side of my house, and I'm going to show you the reason why I spray. And if you're curious, this is the spraying rig I've been using for this year. This is a four-wheeler, a 25-gallon tank, and the world's most janky spraying boom that I have attached to the back of it. Again, first year, ran out of time, but it worked. Now, this field we're walking over to is part of the original five-acre spot that I was on, and it's about three-ish acres and uh it's right adjacent it borders touches the other uh acreage that i have over here and it had a problem that that other acreage really didn't have and let me show you soil's not great it doesn't get a good at water it's not a steeper slope there's a lot of runoff and come and look in here it's got a lot of weed and this is partially my fault. I never really uh, worried about range management on this three acre little field over here because I wasn't doing anything with it. I just kind of sat here. There's like a bonus to the rest of my property. And here's the problem. This turns into that. You see how tall this is? Now look down over here even further. This is about three foot tall of weeds. And they come up quick. And they will out compete anything that you come and plant in this field. This is a second cutting of our Sudex. And you see it's starting to leaf up again, but it takes a while for this to sprig up. This comes up overnight. This was not here five days ago when this hay was cut and now it's back. And the only way to get rid of it is to inoculate it with herbicide. Now, I'm not saying flood your fields with herbicide every single year. But when you're getting started, you're going to have the same problems I have, which is unmanaged land that is inundated with weeds of all different varieties, a lot of which are noxic to livestock. And if you're going to sell hay, you can't have weeds in the hay. Now that's at the periphery of the field. If we get out further into the field, there's almost none of this because I sprayed it all. And I will spray it again after I get this second cutting raked and baled. You can also see out here in the middle of this field, I didn't get that good a stand. That's because of soil health. Now, another thing about being an overnight farmer is you got a lot to learn about dirt. Good night, nobody ever tells you. There's so much to know about dirt. You look at it, you think, it's just dirt. Well, it's not just dirt, okay? You see this? It's kind of rocky, a little sandy. Doesn't, doesn't hold the water as well. So, is spraying chemicals my favorite thing? Absolutely not. And I take uh, about as much precaution as I can possibly take. I wear long sleeve clothes, rain boots, a mask, respirator, 
safety glasses and uh, gloves. And this is on attempt to not have to expose myself to these caustic, not good chemicals. And they're not great. They're not good for animals. They're not good for humans. They're not particularly good for your soul. But what's really not good is to spend a lot of money on equipment and diesel and seed and you plant it on the ground only to have it taken over by weeds. So life is, like always, kind of in the gray. There's no such thing as black and white. There's no such thing as good and evil. It all kind of coexists at the same time. And you gotta take your precautions where you can take them. Now for this first year, on broken ground, whole set of weeds, I sprayed 240 amine and it worked. It worked good. Knocked the weed pressure off, allowed my pseudo grass to come up. And once you get that cover canopy, now you can let nature decide who gets to live and who doesn't. And it pushed out the weed pressure. Another fun thing about hay grazer is it does exudate a certain chemical that inoculates weeds. So there's that fun fact. So on top of everything else you're trying to research, find my equipment, and you're learning about soil, and now you're having to learn about chemicals and what's the best chemical to use. There's specialty types like Duracore that I think I'm gonna switch to. I haven't used before. But it's advertised as I can use it with my organic fertilizer that I'm buying. You heard me right, organic fertilizer, because urea nitrogen, also not good for soil. You'll learn that along your way. On top of all that, you're gonna need a planter. Now, this beautiful giant hunk of rust is I believe a case hard to tell like I said it's all rusty parts of it are green kind of looks like a John Deere it says case on the side every air wheel could be fabric cobbled together now I don't own this particular grain drill I borrowed it from a neighbor uh, who's very generous and actually used to hay this exact field I was on years ago uh, now he's enjoying retirement and not messing with this foolhardy plan of trying to make money off the dirt he was kind enough to let me borrow this somewhat indefinitely. I put a lot of work into it, oiled it up, got it free, greased all the bearings, trained everything, cleaned out the hopper, and it worked. As you can see, I've been so busy, I hadn't even got the rest of the leftover seed. Now, if you're wondering, here's what your seed's gonna look like. Get it in the light there. If you notice, it's kind of a weird purpley color. That's because most of your seed you're gonna buy from the store is already covered in a pre-emergent pesticide that's going to keep bugs from coming in and eating the seed while you plant. I'm trying not to get too carried away because this is more of how do you get started not how do you do it because I don't even know what I'm doing. All right so you bought the land you cleared it you put all the diesel and the dirt on the skid steer to clear it and do all the things you bought the plow you plowed the field you plowed the dirt you turned it over you got all the things done you spray pre-emergent or maybe you spray after a post-emergent after you plant with your seed grill that you now own <sighs> and you're thinking boy now what i'll show you so you got all the seed in the ground and you're wondering well that was pretty easy now all i gotta do is kick my heels back and hope it rains and boy do ya you gotta hope it rains and you gotta hope that there wasn't enough moisture in the soil to get it started and it doesn't rain for two months and everything dies. You also gotta hope there is some moisture in the soil that it gets started and it does rain. You're really not gonna like the weather now. You're an overnight farmer. So in this little journey that started about six months ago and really intensified about three months ago and it's kind of hit its peak about, well, now, the next thing we went and bought is a swather. A swather? What is a swather? Well, I'll tell you. This is a swather. Now, this is older technology, but because I invested all my money into other equipment and land and seed and diesel, uh, I'm running out of money, and we want to buy something that was effective for this year, and we get the job done. Not exactly what I did, and I'll show you why, and maybe save you a little heartache. So these are called mower conditioners, or swathers. This is a John Deere 1214 MoCo, which stands for mower conditioner. And the way these suckers work, they have a hydraulic pump. They stick to the 540 PTO on your tractor. You're gonna learn there's a thousand and there's 540 PTO. It shoots oil up these hoses here. And then terminates the oil's journey into a motor. This hydraulic motor spins 
this chain, which spins that sprocket, which moves a complex series, again, of pulleys and chains and sprockets that look like something out of a Dr. Seuss book. Now, this is all fine and well, and it works pretty good. And I'll show you how the mechanism works. So you're driving your Dr. Seuss game chairs and you're wondering what it does. Well, all simultaneously, it does a lot of things all at once. So starting out with the working end, you have a sickle bar. And what this sickle bar does is it moves those teeth back and forth between those guards and it's like a giant pair of scissors and it just cuts the grass off. It's that simple. Now, while those are going back and forth, this big wheel is spinning around and these springy things, I think they're called fingers? I'm not sure. Again, I'm not a farmer. Whack the grass into the toting teeth. As it gets whacked, it lifts them up into this trolley here and then it moves it to an auger. This auger spins and moves everything over here into the center. And there in the center, you see the conditioners. So it's called a mower conditioner. So the sickle bar does the mowing and uh, I think you guessed it, the conditioners do the conditioning. So down here in the abyss underneath is your conditioners. And now what happens is everything is turning, these turn as well, and they pick up the grass from the center and they spin around and they spit it out. And right here in that gap, they pinch this grass and they break the stalk. Now what that allows is that these breaks in the stalk let moisture come out more readily and it lowers the drying time of your hay. Where we messed up is these conditioners are trash. If you look over here, there's a large gap. If you look over here, that's a large gap. The problem with that being, a lot of this hay didn't get conditioned properly. And now I'm in a cycle of perpetually waiting for these thick stalks of hay grain to dry out. That's not the end of the world, but it is an inconvenience because there's rain in the forecast and I still have giant piles of hay that I cut four or five days ago that are not even yet to be raked. So, in your journey as you go look around and you think you find yourself a great deal on a swather, now you know, get underneath, look at the conditioners, and make sure that they get close enough to actually do their job. When I get it, it seems like you should be close to the end. And you almost are, but you never are. Because as you go along in this journey and you make mistakes, and you buy equipment that doesn't properly work, you buy undersized equipment that you thought would work, but now it seems like it really doesn't. It seems to me, based on my short-lived experience, is that you're in a perpetual mode for the rest of your life of buying, selling, trading, and maintaining equipment. The next thing I purchased uh, in this arduous and very short journey of becoming a farmer overnight is a hay rake. This is important because you gotta rake hay. Now you can tell that it's a hay rake by the way it is uh, in the fact that it rakes hay. And these are extremely simple machines. This is a three-point version that runs on a PTO shaft. I have yet another version that I bought previously in much worse condition. It is a pull type that is gear or driven by the wheel. So how these work is this bar rotates around and it picks up hay. I think I still have it strapped in position. You can figure it out. It runs around, his teeth kick the hay off, flip the row over, put it in a nice little pile. So you can run it through yet another piece of equipment. Now, boy, howdy. Uh, one thing I've learned on forums and groups and conversation is farmers are like any other kind of group of people and they're extremely opinionated and they're very brand loyal. And if you disagree with what they agree with, they're not gonna be happy with their choices and equipment. So you got that to look forward to as well. Now, the problem with trying to make money on small acreage is the fact that you don't have any money probably to start off with, or not enough to where you're gonna go buy a $30,000 piece of equipment. That's where we've been showing you used equipment. And one of the most important pieces of that used equipment is a way to get the hay into a square shape that bundles tightly where you can sell it to people and little nuggets of grass for money. And that's the whole goal here, right? To make a little money. So what we have here is a New Holland 320 uh, square baler. This particular model is about 40 years old and as to date makes the newest piece of equipment on the farm. With a 1969 trailer, a 1973 cutter, and a God knows what age rate, probably about the 80s. This was the cleanest baler I could find 
within 300 miles of my living situation. Now, Square Builders has been around for quite a while, and I think even going back to about World War II, maybe even a little before. I don't know who invented them, but uh, they're extremely complex machines, and like everything else you've seen, kind of Dr. Seuss's. You know what I mean? So now as we continue this walk around tour and you're going through all the mental checklist of everything you have to learn simultaneously while trying to buy equipment, plant, get everything in the ground, hope it rains, keep everything clean, maintain and rebuild new equipment that you just got on the farm and needs rebuilt on everything probably. Because uh, if you're like me, you didn't have enough money to go buy the nice stuff and you won't make any money if you go buy all the new stuff because you don't got enough land to be a real farmer. Now you gotta learn about square mailers. So we're gonna start up here at the front. You get a PTO. This tongue swings out to the side so that your baler can be out to the side of the tractor to pick up the windrow of hay. Now it goes through the front of this header here, and that's what that's called. And you know, all the hay gets scooped up by the little teeth, uh, kind of like what we just saw in the swallow. So imagine your hay and you're getting woo, picked up, you pulled around, you go over to here. Wow, it's a whole new world and environment. You look up and you see these things. You can kind of see them. If I can get my arm in there far enough. Well, they're called fingers, and what the fingers do is they drop down as the machine's running, and they scoop all the hay that just came up back in here into the channel, and it scoops it back in to the baler chamber. As it goes into the baler chamber, you can see that's a giant knife on the end of what's called a plunger. That's because that thing goes in there like a plunger. You can tell it's a plunger by the way it's called. So now that we've seen uh, from the other side, we're going to go to here. The drive shaft drives this big old flywheel here, which runs the whole machine, really. And it's got a slip clutch and shear bolts. It goes into the gearbox, which drives more pulleys and more sprockets. It also moves this big old plunger. Now this big plunger goes round and round, back and forth. And as hay gets pushed into the chamber by the feeders, it comes down and it packs the hay and comes back up. If you've ever done done done, blah, blah, blah. if you've ever undone a square bell, you'll know that it's kind of formed in leaves. This is where the leaves come from. Now under this cover is more Dr. Seuss's looking type of equipment and timing and gears and chains and sprockets and pulleys and well it's it's all very complex. I don't know how any of it really works. So we get to the back. We look into the bell chamber here. You can see the end of the plunger kind of. It's pretty dark in there, but it packs hay back into here. And then as the hay meets its terminal length and it's ready to be turned into a square grass nugget we got this these are called they're knotters they're twisters depending whether or not you have a wire or a strand machine this particular machine is wire that's what's popular around here that's what i was advised to get i don't know why it's much more expensive i would probably get a twine machine looking back but we got what we got now so in this complex mechanism of things i probably will never be able to wrap my hand around comes in wire, it gets twisted here. And it's got these fingers or plunger arms or I don't even know what they're called necessarily. Again, I am not a farmer, but it takes your wire and it throws it up around the end of this freshly made bell. It brings it up here to these twisters and then it twists wire. And you can tell that it does that because they named it a twister. Or maybe I'm just making that up. I really don't know. So let's recap. You bought the land, you rented a tractor or a skid steer and you did a bunch of grabbing and you put a lot of money into the diesel and you tore up the fields and then you bought a tractor and then you did a lot of work to a tractor and you bought a plow and maybe a harrow and maybe a bunch of other things like a chisel or whatever tools you need to turn your messed up jacked up field into something that's remotely smooth enough and then you beg, bleed and paro for a grain drill or you buy one and you fix it up and then you plant a bunch of seed and then now you check your weather out 47 times a day and you have a whole new folder that's full of just different weather apps because you can't just trust one because they're all liars. I digress. Now you got a cutter. You got all this stuff. You got a hay rake. You got a baler. You got everything you think you need. Well, here's one small problem. You still got to get the stuff out of the field. Now, if you're going to go to a different route, you want a round bale, uh, which I wouldn't because there's no money in small acres round bales. You'll probably get 20 and you're only going to sell them for hundred bucks and that's two grand and that doesn't even cover the expenses of diesel for the year. You're gonna need something to get hay out of the field. Or if you seem like you think this is a lot of stuff, you should go look at a real farmer's place sometime. This is like one man's one year of farming and it looks like I have a whole stockpile of equipment. Go to a real farm, they got generations of equipment. It looks kind of like a tractor junkyard.
I mean, it's because they need it. All of it. So now you're thinking, whoo, it's all done. I got the hay planted, everything's good. Well, you need one of these things. Now you can get a goose neck trailer, but they're smaller and they're not as practical. And for my purposes, this is what I got. Now, some of you who are somewhat familiar with farming and probably have seen these around, know this is a cotton trailer. So when you're a cotton farmer, you strip all the cotton off and you gotta do something with it before you make it into giant cotton bales to ship it off. You put it in this trailer and you haul it around. Now, this is 32 foot. It's got four axles on it, and I'm going to repurpose it, like a many of folks before me, into a hay trailer. So the intent is, now you got a bunch of square bales all over the field. If your year went good and you actually made some hay and you didn't lose all your money, which is a possibility, you got to go get that hay out of the ground so your next crop, your second cutting or third cutting, depending on where you're at, can come up out of the ground and you don't get rain all over your nice new square bale. This is where the trailer comes in. You're gonna stack it. Now, the old timers used to hire uh, high school football player teams for about, I don't know, like a nickel a bell, maybe less back in the day. Uh, kids nowadays don't wanna work, and if they do, it's gonna cost you probably 300 a day to get anybody out here to do manual labor. That's not very efficient. So unless you have a whole household full of young strapping males that happen to be your sons and you can force them into slave labor, or if you're too young for that like me and only have little toddlers, here's what you get next. This is called a hay thrower, hay elevator, hay tosser. I've heard it called a lot of things. I actually don't know what the name is. I don't even know what brand this is. I just bought it from a dude for 600 bucks. Now, the way this machine works is it does not go like this in the field. So take everything you're seeing and flip it upside down. Now in this direction, as you drive through the field, hay comes and it goes right through here. And there's a chain sprocket that flips them up, runs them, and then kicks them out over here as you're pulling it beside the trailer so you don't have to pick them up and throw them on the trailer. You just grab them and stack them. Here's what the inside of this looks. Now imagine, again, this is going up and not laying horizontal. It's got this chain, it's got these hooks that grab onto the hay bale, folds it through there, and like I said, kicks it out, and it's pretty nifty. If you look over here, that's where you attach it to the side of your trailer and drag it through the field. Now, that's a whole lot of stuff. And I hope if you do become an overnight farmer, you buy your stuff earlier to get a head start on getting all this stuff. And you don't wait till April to decide you want to go ahead and plant some hay and make a crop and spend the next two months scrambling like mad to uh, get all the equipment gathered up and to make, uh, make it work. So far, I've been fortunate. I've had a lot of work. I've completely rebuilt the pump and the motor on this swather and a few other things. And I've barely got it done at the nick of time. And I've been fortunate with rain. And I might actually make a little bit of a turn this year. Now, just because you went and bought all this and you got some things on the ground, don't think you're done because you still got to make a crop every season available. So now you're looking into, well, what do I plant? And uh, I don't have any answers for you on that. Depends on your climate, your situation, your land type, your wants, your woes, who you are, and what kind of grass you like to eat. Just kidding, we eat beef. So as this little journey of mine continues, I hope to make more videos and try to help with the edification of some stuff that may not be abundantly apparent. Maybe you're not as fortunate as me and have somebody that actually knows what they're doing to help you along the way. Because even with that, I'm not doing a great job. Now going forward, my hope and goal is to move into a more regenerative approach to hay farming and get perennial grasses and during the winter plant a maybe beardless wheat with legumes to help fix nitrogen. Now, like I already said, I found a company that makes organic fertilizer that's close here in Texas. They're from Moody. They're called Texas Pasture Plus. And they have different products that have actual microorganisms in it that feed the soil, not just the plant, and doesn't salt your field. I claim to know nothing, and I'm probably doing everything slightly wrong, and it's been a scramble. So, if you find yourself with a piece of land and you decide you want to become an overnight farmer, I hope this gets you on the way. So you're a farmer now, and you got to be a little grumpy, and you got to be mad at the weather, have all the weather apps, and everyone you meet, you got to just constantly talk about the weather and how it hasn't rained, or it rained too much, or it rained when it didn't need to, or it won't rain at all ever again, and your life is ruined. It's a lot of fun. I really recommend it. You should go buy you some land and spend all your time toiling with old equipment covered in hydraulic oil like I've done. This is Hal, become an overnight farmer. <laughs>